Then we can try to think in a flight contemplate. Generally speaking, our human life is very fragile and short. And especially in current conditions, it seems even more fragile. So therefore, it's hard to know when our health might have a deteriorate, when our life might come to an end. So we never know how much time we have to practice the Dharma. Therefore, whatever time we have, years, months, weeks, days, whatever time we have, we should try to use it as much as possible to practice the Dharma. By studying, reflecting, contemplating, and put into practice every day as much as possible. And that's the best way to make our life more meaningful, more beneficial. And also that's the best way to prepare for our final days and weeks in this world at the time of death and for future after the death. So therefore, make a strong determination. I will try as much as possible to dedicate myself to put more effort, more energy to the practice of the Dharma. And not only for myself, but in order to be most and greatest benefit to all sentient beings in general, especially to those with whom have karmic connection and that we come into contact in our everyday life. And by coming together here and studying together with the good intentions, may it become cause and conditions to oneself and all sentient beings to achieve Buddhahood as soon as possible. So we can be greatest help and benefit to all sentient beings.
I first to the area people Jen, thus did I hear one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of Bodhisattva mountain in Ras Geha together with the great community of monks and great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time the Bhagavan was observed in the concentration of the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokishora looked upon the very practice of profound perfection and wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shari Buddha said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Lokishora, how should any son of the lineage train who wish to practice the activities of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Lokishora said this to the Venerable Shari Buddha. Shari Buddha, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wish to practice the activities of the profound perfection of wisdom, Wisdom should look around. Should look around it like. I think there was something. Correctly and repeatedly beholding. Those ever aggregate as empty of inherent nature form is empty emptiness from emptiness not other than form form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, combustion, of character, and consciousness are empty. Shari Buddha, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not division, not fulfilled. Shari Buddha, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no combustion of factors, and no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no order, no taste, no object, no touch, and no phenomena. Maybe we should go one page. I think that will be more easier. Page by page. There, Thank you, Kevin. There, there's no I element and so on up to and including no mind element, no mental constant element. There's no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on. And up to and including no aging and death, no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origin, cessation, and the death. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non attainment. Shari Buddha, therefore, because there is no attainment, both sort of rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obs obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to the unsurprisable, perfect, complete enlightenment in the reliance on perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurprised mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that totally has a suffering, should be known as the truth as since it is not false. The mantra of perfection of wisdom declare, Tayata, Om Gade Gade, Paragade, Parasam Gade, Bodhi Soha. Shari Buddha, the Bosa Master, that should train in the profound profession of wisdom like that. The Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commented the Bosa Master about Lokeshora saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, is it like that? It is like that. One should practice the profound profession of wisdom, just as you have indicated, even the other God as religious. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadi Tere Buddha, the Bosa Master of Ara Allah Vishora, and those surrounding the entirety, along with these words of God, humans, Asura, and Gandhava, Obojo, and highly praised that is spoken by Bhagavan. Sashi-bhe-ge-chon-shem-e-to-kha-ri-ra-le-se 
I go for refuge until enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient. Sangye Jodan Sogye Sonam Ba Chanju Ba Do Dane Sagi Shuja Gipe Sonam Ke Dola Penjai Sangye Juba Sangye Jodan Sogye Sonam Chanju Ba Do Dane Ke Sagi Shuja Gipe Dola Penjai Sangye Juba Shoba So um So far we have um, finished the karma abiding uh, and uh, you know um, once you have achieved karma abiding then you can attend you know um, a different level of higher um, meditative concentrations um, of as I mentioned a little bit last time um of four uh, belonging to the form realms and four uh, belonging to the formless realms and um the joy the peace inner peace and the blissfulness that one that one attain when you have this um come abiding cannot be described by any kind of pleasure that we experience in the worldly uh, world um, in a, in a, in terms of in relation to the um, desire realms and in relation to uh, sense pleasures and because such a blissfulness peacefulness and joy is such a um, such a great that those meditators have no attachment to the desire, uh, um, the desire sense objects, you know, and uh, because compared to all the sensory pleasure that we experience, highest level of sensory pleasure we experience in relation to the desire objects. Um, when it comes to that come abiding, the great blissfulness and peacefulness, uh, it comes not nowhere. And so, again, as you, your, as you, you know, achieve more higher material concentrations of the, um, you know, from come abiding to then uh, material concentration of um, the first level of the. Um, form level, form realm, second, and then second, third, and fourth, you know, um, the blissfulness, the peacefulness, even to become more and more kind of subtle and more and more, um, more and more um, more and more greater. And um, with each state, you overcome some of more uh, certain gross level of mind, um, um, you know, certain level, without going so much detail, there are certain gross level in, uh, even after you have reached a uh, first level of material concentration of first ram, and then you overcome that, and then second level, and then this, from, uh, or by overcoming certain uh, gross level mental states. And then once you come to uh, f formless realms, then you know it's more about the objects. The object of meditation become more and more subtle. The object of meditation become more subtle and subtle uh, in form of, uh, as I mentioned before, 
like uh, the object of your meditations, material concentration, space, from space, then consciousness, from conscious, then there's no object, there's even no objects, nothing. Uh, and from there, then um, the, uh, the most subtle is uh, the, the peak, peak of the peak of the samsara. And so, so again, uh, your meditative concentration become more and more stronger, more and more deeper, more and more um, strong, more sharp, and more blissfulness, more peacefulness. Even if that is, is a case, but still, unless we have the, uh, the wisdom realizing emptiness, we cannot overcome the delu delusions from the very root of it. By all these different levels of meditative concentrations, as we mentioned, as Lama Tsongkhapa mentioned, you can kind of stop any delusion arising during the meditative state, um, because all these delusions um, are concept and thoughts. So you can stop all these concepts and thought from arising or manifesting. And not only during the meditative state, because of your meditative, your meditation is so strong, even when you are not in meditative state, even during the post meditative state, you could still have that impact of that meditative state, still you will have a certain level of blissfulness, uh, um, the plenty, and then also the delusions do not manifest so strongly and so frequently. So even though it has certain impact, not only on during the meditation session, but even when you are not in deep meditation, when even you are in worldly, in other actions, still, because of the, your that strong meditative um, that has still impact where it doesn't allow delusion to arise so strongly, um, so frequently, um, so long, and as well, as long as um, um, so even it, even it arises, it's very short, subtle, and not lasting long, and also it does have impact, but still still the subtle delusions continue to manifest because the very root of those subtle delusions has not been eradicated, has not been eliminated, the, the fundamental ignorance. As long as there is fundamental ignorance, then, you know, due to that, then subtle attachments, uh, anger and and other delusion will continue to arise. And so therefore, um, one cannot free completely from the, all the suffering and from the samsara. And the only way to free from the samsara with the, with the help of the tool of the uh, um, come abiding, then we need to develop the, um, the, the special insight, vipassana, the wisdom realizing emptiness. And so therefore the wisdom realizing emptiness or special insight is the crucial to free from all those delusions, not only gross, not only from manifesting delusion, from, from the very root of the delusions. The shamatha can help us to overcome the manifesting delusion, but it cannot overcome the very root of the delusions. Whereas this special insight will help us to overcome from the very root of delusions. And when you are overcome from very root of delusions, then even when you met external, internal cause and condition for the delusion arises, the del delusion cannot arise because there is no seed, the root there anymore. Um, so another way of putting, my, maybe it might be a uh, way to help might be, you know, Shamada is like, you know, uh, a, a, a seed there, or plant or seed, plant or seed or plant, which is ready to grow, but not allowing any conducive conditions. If you don't give water 
all of that, then that seed cannot grow. But the moment it, it encounters the conducive condition, then it will grow, you know? As long as you can keep away the conducive conditions, it will not grow. But moment, you cannot keep away the conducive condition and the, when the condi conducive condition, the seed will grow, the delusion will arise. Whereas through the, the wisdom realizing emptiness, the special insight, one you have cut the very root of that, then is you have taken away the, the seeds. So even, even you know, pour water, even that there is light and all the condition, there's no way it could arise because there is no seed at all. So, um, so similarly that is, so I think maybe, um, so I think that that is just a little bit on kind of um, kind of um, so why the, the why the um, why shamata or or kama abiding itself is not enough, but instead we need to develop the develop the um, special insight of vipassana in order to overcome the delusions. So, okay, so we are on page number 221. And, uh, and then we start with the explanation how to change special insight, the integer of wisdom. So within that, you know, um, first there is uh, how to change in special insight, and then there is four outlines, uh, you know, um, within that. Oh, four point, you know, four point, and I don't need to go each of them. And then uh, uh, among the, those four point, um, the first point is um, what are the requirements or preliminary or prerequisites for the special insight? Um, and that has two, two, uh, two general outline you can see. And then first one in general presentation, how to rely on pre prerequisites of special insight and that has three. And then, you know, um, so that is according to the, the Kamala Shila stage of meditation too, it has said, you know, one is relying on the holy beings um, and then seeking to hear the Dharma from there and reflect on it properly. So these are, um, must need, you know. In, in order to have special insight, in order to have special insight, you know, you need to have, um, you need to develop the wisdom realizing the, the reality of ultimate truth. And in order to, um, have an understanding of ultimate truth or reality, um, we need to rely on um, qualified teacher, spiritual teachers to explain us um, because it's not an easy subject. It's, it is not something that you can just read and understand it. You know, we are not even talking about realization, even just intellectual understanding. Even many of us who have studied um, the ultimate reality of emptiness for so many years, still sometimes we struggle. Sometimes we feel like we understood and sometimes we feel like we didn't understand. And um, and so therefore, since it's not an easy subject, 
we need to uh, study, learn from a, uh, qualified teachers, at least who have understanding of some understanding, at least intellectual understanding, correct, unmistaken um, uh, intellectual understanding of the subjects, uh, the emptiness, the essential point um, of the scriptures, you know, that you uh, need um, at least according to, if possible, according to the understanding of four different tenets of the Buddhist tenets, and um, if possible, all of that, you know. Um, so we need to rely on, and the purpose to rely on such teachers is so that we can hear and then um, we can hear and study. And then it is not enough just to hear it and, and study it. You know, and um, we need to reflect and contemplate on what we have learned, what we have studied. It's a post I did today. So we we need to Fine. we need to it's a visual. We need to we need to <laughs> we need to reflect, contemplate on what we, have, what we have heard. So first you hear the, whether you listen and hear the teachings and you read yourself and you know, you have little understanding through hearing. Then you have to go beyond that by reflecting on that, what you have heard, the meaning, with the reasoning and logic and thinking, investigating, analyzing. so that your understanding become more deeper. You know, it's like you heard some, something and then now is you don't rely on what you heard. Now you try to investigate, analyze what you heard is true or not with all kinds of evidence and reasoning and logics and your own data experiences, you know, through that. Um, and once through that kind of reflecting again and again by analyzing, investigating, then you come to a certainty that that is correct, that is unmistaken, absolute correct, now you are not too mind about it, you know, that, that you have not too mind about it, you are absolutely sure, certainty that in these cases, that is what the ultimate nature is, that is what the emptiness is. So again, that itself is not enough. You have certainty of that, you have no doubt about it, your mind is not too minded, because you have done enough investigation, analysis to come to that conclusions, is absolutely correct, certainty, but when you think, when you think it comes, when you don't think it doesn't come. You know, when you meditate, then you start to feel a little bit. But when you don't meditate, then it doesn't come. So then you need to meditate. The, the certainty, um, the, the certainty that you gain through that kind of investigation, analyzing, um, the certainty that you gain, now you need to repeat it again and again, the exercise, the meditations, that again and again, until you started to feel very naturally, spontaneously, all the time. You don't have to sit on cushions, it just arises. Just like at the moment, delusions are like that for us, because of familiarity. And so meditation is making that familiarity. And so then, um, then, so then that is your understanding or realizations or emptiness go more deeper from reflecting to meditations. And then your wisdom also get more deeper. The, 
wisdom that you are, you realize by hearing the wisdom then you go further the wisdom realizing emptiness through hearing the wisdom realizing from reflecting and the wisdom realizing from meditations so the three different le- uh, more progressive three different level of meditation that kamala shila explained and so this is uh, you know in order that that come um, the special insight that come through meditations pre requirement is the the wisdom through um uh, reflecting and hearing and to 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 have that wisdom then we need a qualified um teacher who can explain who understand and who can explain um unmistakably correctly so that is that is the way it is it is um it says i think those that so in here those are the main main kind of stand and then of course on top of that in order to come abiding you need i mean in order to have the special insight you need to also have the come abiding before that we already discussed that you know in order to have the special insight you need to come abiding now uh, that is on it in order to have a um in order to have a come abiding you need to have a strong foundation or moral discipline so that is the high three high training the three high training the high in you know, moral discipline and on the foundation good foundation the moral discipline and then you develop the um higher training of meditative concentration or come abiding on the basis of meditative concentration come abiding then you develop the higher training of the wisdom the wisdom realizing emptiness so and then um definitely um it require a lot of also um uh, purification accumulation of merit as well and then that we see that throughout the life story of many of the great masters um you know um where that purification accumulation also play a big role in their um having the correct realizations of that some of them they have been meditating for a long time but still they couldn't have the realizations and then once they started to apply some purification or accumulation method and with the support of that then uh, they were able to uh, develop the correct realizations and you, you see that in the um, story of all the um, great masters um, you know um, so those are kind of the uh, requirements and um, preliminary kind of requirement for the special insight um, as oh, that um i think is uh ara deva i think in for understand that even though i'm not 100% sure um as he said you know um if you don't have enough merit you not you will not even have the the karma to hear the teaching on teaching on emptiness even just to hear forget about realization of through meditation forget about um understanding through reflections hearing forget about having even intellectual understanding even to just to hear the teaching on emptiness it require a lot of effort he says you know people who does not have enough merit they will not even have the karma to receive the teaching on that and to hear those teachings and even if we have karma and merit if we don't have strong merit even if we hear it we, we will have a lot of fear about it you know you don't want to hear any more it led you to fearful you know and it is best because we don't have enough merit 
for those who have enough merit, it gives them an excitement. They want to hear more. They want to hear more. They want to investigate more. They want to study more. It gives them some kind of, even they don't understand it, it gives them kind of, you know, enthusiasm, excitement. But if you don't have enough, enough um, merit, then it makes you very fearful and not wanting to study or not wanting to engage, you know. And he said, you know, even if you have doubt about the, even if you have doubt about the car, um, the emptiness, here we are not talking about correct understanding, even intellectual, even if you have doubt, that will shake the uh, samsara, you know, your delusions. Even, the, even just having the doubt will kind of, um, you know, um, overcome um, or started to kind of shake the, uh, the, your delusions and the foundation of your delusion, the fundamental ignorance. Sometimes I like to present in this way, um, that, that statement, you know, uh, the way I understand, um, it helped me in that way, you know, even though I don't see that kind of uh, commentary, but it's like the delusions, especially the fundamental ignorance. Fundamental ignorance has been like the king who, have, who was never challenged, you know. Fundamental, the fundamental ignorance, like the king or leader, who have never been challenged. So he feel very comfortable. Doesn't feel any kind of, you know, threatening by anyone. You know, doesn't feel threatening by and feel very comfortable. And when someone started to caution, he started a little shaky, you know. Any leader, any leader, when someone disagree and started to ask questions, they started to become threat. They feel threatening. They feel threatening. They started to become more shaky. And that is what we see all over the world. All over the world. They don't want to be threatened. They don't want to be cautions and um, uh, threatening that way. Once they do that, same way when we started to doubt about ultimate reality, emptiness, now the ignorance is seeing that, oh, it has been challenged now. Someone is challenging them. Someone is doubting that what that they have said, what the ignorance has been kind of um, saying so far. And so therefore ignorance started with a little bit shaky, unstable. And when that ignorance become unshake, uh, become shaky, uh, unstable, then all the delusions that rely on that ignorance also become unstable, shaky. So you have once even just having doubt, we have started to shake that foundations. You know. So therefore, uh, um, so therefore as. Um, You need a, we need a lot of merit. And for us to be able to have this um, opportunity to hear, to study, to reflect, to contemplate on emptiness, whether we have realization or not, just to have that means we, we must have created a lot of merit in the past. We just, therefore, we should also rejoice that. Rejoice that we must have created some good merit to be able to have that kind of um, um, such a great conditions and then continue to create some more merit. So we will continue to have such conditions, even better conditions uh, in the futures uh, so that we can have a um, correct, unmistaken realizations, special insight. Um, you know, so that, that, that is, a, Mm. Really request, request, uh, requested, um, really request, requested, sits.
the preliminary the required you know so so once we have but then you know um so relying on teacher unmistaken qualified teachers once you rely the reason to rely is to hear the teaching to study that that teachings once you have hear the teaching study then we need to reflect and then contemplate meditate and so that is the point um, so then if we need to study so again i think maybe um I, again i maybe i might want to make little bit um remind again i think even though i think um i've mentioned before and his holiness always mentioned you know um Correct understanding emptiness is so crucial, so crucial to free from the samsara. In also in order to have a um, true unmistaken faith to the Buddha, and Dharma Sangha. You know, in order to have a unmistaken uh, true certainty and faith to the Dharma and the teachers. In order to have a very strong bodhicitta mind, we need to have certain level of understanding of emptiness. When we have an understanding of emptiness, then we begin to see the possible of overcoming all the delusions. If we don't have understanding of the emptiness, we couldn't see the possible of overcoming the delusions. If you don't see the possible of overcoming the delusion, then you can't see the possible, you can't feel and you can't see and feel possibly of Nirvana, even though we say the words, you know, even though we say the word Nirvana or fully enlightenment, the Buddha word, we say that word and we might have some kind of inspirations, aspiration for that, but still we don't really see, we don't really feel it is possible. Isn't it? Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we doubt. Can this delusion be overcome? It seems like it can be reduced a little bit, but it doesn't seem like it can be totally overcome, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Maybe you don't feel that way, but maybe I feel that way sometimes. You know, sometimes when you when you are when you are kind of you know going through some kind of emotions whatever that might be you know it could be fear or worry and you try to meditate and then you can kind of reduce and overcome that fear after some time sometimes you have some kind of resentment or anger or whatever and then again you try to meditate a little bit as much as you can and it seems it can be subside and then uh, you can let it go after some times um, same with attachment and all of that but again, after some time, all this again comes. Again, you have to redo that. And you think you, you have done it, then again. And so sometimes you feel like, you know, well, we can reduce those through meditation and practice. We can minimize them. We can subside them. We can reduce them for temporary for a while. But I don't think we can really overcome all the delusion completely where there's a point where the delusion doesn't arise at all. Sometimes we feel that. At least I feel that, you know. And that is because we don't have the correct understanding of emptiness. When we have correct understanding of emptiness, then you have no doubt. You have no doubt. You are very certain, 100% certain, that those delusions can be overcome. And since delusion can overcome, then you have certain, it's not saying from your uh, mouth, but from your depth of your heart, you feel nirvana is possible. Fully enlightenment is possible. 
And when you see that fully enlightened possible, then, then you have much more stronger inspiration to achieve that fully enlightenment. When you see your delusion can be overcome, sentient being delusion can be overcome. And due to not overcoming the delusion, that is why we are suffering. Why one said is suffering? Why sentient beings are suffering? Because of those delusions. Then you feel compassion for them. Because you see there's a way out of that suffering, but you, you are not doing that. You know, if there's no way out of that, then you can, you, what, what can you do? You know, you just feel pity. But when you see there is a way out of that, but because due to ignorance, due to delusion, they are not, therefore they are suffering. And that can be then you, then you can feel compassion for them. Then your compassion becomes much more stronger. Your compassion becomes much more stronger. Uh, you know? And then because not only you have compassion, because you see, fully enlightenment possible, and if you can achieve fully enlightenment, how much benefit you can do to sentient beings, then your desire, your inspiration to achieve fully enlightenment is much more stronger, much more profound, much more deeper. So when we have understanding of emptiness, then we see the possibility of overcoming delusions, we see the possibility of nirvana, we see the possibility of enlightenment, we see the possibility of end to the, some, uh, end to the suffering of not only one self, all sentient beings. So then it helps to develop the, uh, the loving kindness, compassion, bodhisattva much more stronger. And when you see that, then your devotion to the Buddha who taught that teachings increase, unshakable devotions. That was um, Nagarjuna, uh, write that too. Lama Tsongkhapa, write that too. His Holiness also tell that. All of them, those great masters, their direct experience. Lama Tsongkhapa, in his dependent arising, he says he had some because he was born in a Buddhist country, in a Buddhist family, and he was uh, from very young age, and he has some devotions and faith to the Buddha, but it was kind of, you know, not necessarily very deep from your heart, you know, unshakable depth from your heart, even though there's devotions, faith. But once he understood the emptiness as depending on arising, and depending on arising as the meaning of emptiness, his mind was blown away, you know. His mind was blown away for that incredible teachings. And that is when he, he said he, that is when he felt from his deep of heart, from the bottom of heart, unshakable faith and um, devotions. And that is when he composed that um, praise to dependent arisings. Same, Nagarjuna has same feeling, you know, when he had due to understanding of emptiness, he's, um, he saw the uniqueness of the Buddha, you know. Not only uniqueness, but because he see, you know, because through that teachings and through realization of that, then he see there is, see the end to the suffering of oneself and all sentient beings. Incredible. And that is, and uh, you can see, you know, also His Holiness. He's so much high regard every time talk about Nagarjuna. So much because through Nagarjuna's teachings and writing, he, and then he he understood the. Um, the final ultimate intention of the Buddha, the emptiness. And when he had that, then he incredibly um, developed incredible kind of inspirations, faith, devotions, 
to Lama from Kaba, who, who also helped to understand Nagarjuna, and Nagarjuna, who helped to understand Buddha's uh, uh, the ultimate meanings of the final meanings, and then to the Buddha himself. Um, so, so that is, uh, so then, then when you have such a faith to the Dharma, then you have such a faith to the Buddha who taught that teachings, and then you have such a faith to the Sangha who have actualized those qualities within themselves, then your devotion, your faith to the refuge become much more stronger. And then also our uh, uh, devotion, faith to our gurus also increase because it's through gurus that we are able to receive those teachings. So all this, uh, our practice and realization, all this can be immensely improved and developed very strongly if we have the realizations of the emptiness. Therefore, as His Holiness always say, even though it's not easy, it's difficult, you have to try. It's like, you know, you have to try to, even when, maybe in the West, maybe it's not the case because everyone has access to the dentist and they have all the new, new teeth and that, you know, but in the East, in the old time, when people doesn't have access to, um, to the dentist, you know, as you get old, all your teeth are lost, you know, you have only one or two or three left, you know. Like my mom, my mom didn't have so many of them, you know. So still you try to chew, you know. Even if you cannot really chew it because you don't have enough teeth, but still you try to chew something, you know. Same like that. Even though uh, the teachings on emptiness is difficult and not easy to grasp and to understand, but we start to chew, you know. Still we try to chew it, you know. Even this, and and at the very very, very beginning, you know, I always wondered, you know, why His Holiness teach, even for public talk, you know, a lot of, especially in the recent years, he always talk about emptiness. Sometimes I always wonder, oh, I don't know whether these people who are listening, whether they understand that. So deep, he goes in such deep emptiness teaching. But because he understands how important it is, so he wants to leave imprint. Even they don't understand, at least have the imprint. Because it's so crucial. It's so crucial. You know? So I think His Holiness, even they don't understand anything that what he's saying, especially when it comes to emptiness and especially when he go in depth. Uh, a lot of those audience are, you know, not even a Buddhist. And, but because I think, you know, he sees so important of that subject, that matter, the uh, wisdom realizing emptiness is the key to uh, free from all the delusions. Uh, and so therefore he want to have imprint for, you know, and um, so, so I think, um, yeah, even if we don't have realization, at least we we'll try to have little understanding, intellectually little understanding, and continue to study, continue to um, reflect, contemplate. And when Lama Tsongkhaba, even when he wrote the, the last chapter, wisdom chapter of the great Lamrim, you know, he wasn't sure at the very beginning, he wasn't sure whether he wanted to compose that. He has composed up to the, all the six perfection. Um, and then the last chapter, because he felt maybe it, it, is, so, it is not easy, a difficult topic, maybe most people will not understand and it will not be a great benefit. And uh, it is said, um, Manjushri encouraged him to write and he said, even though it might not be such a great benefit to everyone, but it will be a great benefit to some, some who are truly very interested. So with all what I'm trying to show is just show 
important, but so not easy. And so therefore we shouldn't give up. That is what I'm trying to say, okay? Just because it is difficult, you shouldn't give up because it's like almost like dead and dying, you know? You know, when you come to a situation like that, um, dead and dying, you wouldn't just give up because it's difficult, because you don't want to die, you know, because you want to save your life, because it is such a crucial. So you wouldn't say, oh, I'm tired, I'm difficult, you know, you will try all your effort, whatever there, to protect yourself, to save yourself, if you, are, you know, in the same way, because it's so crucial whether we can overcome the all the delusion of samsara or not, it depends on that, you know? And so therefore, um, so yeah. Um, and so then, so as he said, we have to study. And so when we study, then, you know, we have to rely on, um, to whom to rely on, what, um, you know, um, teachings that you rely on when you are trying to study on emptiness, uh, which masters uh, and which master and which teachings to um, we should rely on because there are many different masters and they, are, they have their own presentation, different schools of thought and within the Buddhist different school of thought on emptiness or selflessness and to, to which particular and so the next one is that um, the need to follow one of the greatest trailblazers as appropriate, you know. Um, so, so tell, there are two uh, great, uh, what is called as um, trailblazer, and that has been proposed, um, pro, um, Lung Tiampa precise by uh, in many sutras and others by uh, Buddha himself and that is Nagarjuna and Asanga okay um, Asanga as a trailblazer and the founder of the mind holy school and uh, um, and then um, Nagarjuna as the founder of Trailblazer of the Middle Way schools, Madhyamikas. And so here, Lama Tsongkhapa is saying we have to rely on that one of the greatest trailblazer, Nagarjunas, uh, in terms of um, trying to understand the emptiness. And so, in terms of that, and then when we're trying to understand such view of the emptiness. We have to rely on um, definite meaning and not uh, interpretive meaning. So again, I think, so now again, it becomes a complicating little bit, okay? Not necessarily complicating, but I think, um, so first of all, we have to understand Okay, maybe what is the first, because we have to rely on definitive meanings, um, definitive meaning teachings and not the interpretive teaching, uh, meaning teachings or sutras. So then what does that mean? Okay. There are different schools of thought, what meaning of that? I won't go into each of them, uh, details, you know, Lama Tsongkhapa has written a Tanya Le Shen Yingbo, I think it might have been translated something, eloquent explanation of definitive and interpretive meaning, I think. And it is one of the Lama Tsongkhapa's greatest writing, the jewel, one of the jewels. Um, His Holiness once mentioned, you know, um, that that writings, that book text was kind of asked, His Holiness asked someone to translate in Sanskrit. And then he showed to one of the very expert and um, Sanskrit 
in the you know uh, in the Varanasi uh, Upadaya, I think Upadaya. And so he told him, how is that this writing? Can you compare this writing with the, some of the Nalanda masters? He was very scholar expert in that. And he, 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 he read and he said, oh, absolutely. There's no doubt this author can be among one of the, those greatest uh, Nalanda masters, you know? Anyway, so in that he, he he give very detailed explanation about different school. I don't need to go, but just to kind of give little information, you know, the minor only schools, you know, um, kind of see the mother of minor only schools, kind of differentiate these two sutras, um, interpretive meaning sutra means those teaching that you cannot take it literally. Okay, you have to interpret meanings. So that is what they say. And definitive meaning, sutras meaning that those sutra you can take it face value and literally you don't have to interpret. So that is what they kind of um, try to differentiate. And then Sava Tantrika Madhyamika or Middle Way School, then they say uh, the subject that explain emptiness as well as you don't have to interpret some else and that is the the definite meaning sutra and then those which explain either the conventional phenomena, not a ultimate phenomena, the, the emptiness, but conventional phenomena and those which need to be interpreted and that is the um, uh, uh, inter interpretive meaning sutras. Then when, when it comes prasangika, because that is Nagarjuna's prasangika point of view, then the sutra, the interpretive, Interpretive meanings means that um, the conventional phenomena and definitive meanings means the ultimate phenomena. And any sutra, the, the main subject of that speech, the definite meaning, the emptiness, is a definitive sutra. And then those sutra which teach the main subjects as the conventional phenomena. The conventional phenomena as the main subjects, um, that is uh, interpretive sutras. So I think with that very, very, um, in a short summarized way, so that, so why it is important? Why is important? It is important because the Buddha's teaching, Buddha said, you know, don't rely on the persons, rely on the teachings. Within the teachings, don't rely on the interpretive, rely on the definitive teachings. And not only Buddha taught that, but also, you know, if you just rely on the Buddha's sutras without using your own reasoning and logic and investigations, then you will find so many contradictions among many different sutras. So then you will be con confused, conflict, because in one sutra, Buddha says something, and then sutra, he says opposite. So if you take everything as fast value, face value, and literally, there's no way you can kind of believe in sutra because you will find so much contradictions if you study all those sutras. Sometimes even one sutra, you might find a little bit of difference. So for example, you know, uh, in the first teaching of the uh, Wheel of Dharma, um, Buddha explained, uh, most of the phenomena to be exist um, inherently. Then in the second turning wheel of Dharma, such as Hath Sutra, Buddha explained all phenomena are non truly existent, uh, non inherent existence. And then in some part of the third turning wheel of the Dharma, not a whole, but some part of that, then he explained, well, some phenomena exist inherently and some phenomena do not exist, exist non inherently. So then to differentiate 
So you see contradiction in all these three sutras. Which is to believe, which is not to believe. So if you take as Buddha's own words from the sutra, if you just based on what Buddha said in sutra, then you see all these contradictions. So either Buddha must be confused, crazy, unstable, or there must be something more than that, you know? And so therefore, then we have to understand among those different teachings, sutras, which sutra is definitive meaning sutra and which sutra is interpretive meaning sutras. We have to differentiate that. And those sutra which are interpretive meaning sutra, then we have to interpret it, the meaning of that is something else and not take it face value or literally. And so, so Buddha himself said, you know, as, you know, he himself said, don't believe because I said so. You know, you investigate thoroughly, analyze and investigate thoroughly, and through investigating and analysis, you know, uh, if you don't find any con contradictions or any fault, then you can accept it. But if you find there is a um, contradictions or, or fault, then you, can, uh, you don't have to accept because I said so. And then he give an example, just as the goldsmith will um, evaluate the purity of gold by cutting, by rubbing, and by um, uh, burning in the fire and see whether it's pure or not. Same way you analyze through three different type of analysis to my teaching and if they are, um, if they can withstand, if those teaching can withstand those analysis and investigation, then you can take it. If you cannot, if you cannot withstand the reasoning, logic, investigation, and direct experience, then you shouldn't, you don't have to take it. That is Buddha's teachings. You find in Sutra, and that is what exactly Nagarjuna also did. Nagarjuna didn't accept all the Buddha's teaching literally. Nagarjuna and all the great Indian masters, they didn't take all the Buddha's teaching, neither their teachers, advice, instruction, teaching, all of them, they didn't take all of them as literally or face value. They investigated each of them, analyzed each of them. And those which can, when through that kind of deep analysis, and investigation, those which can withstand those analysis, they took it, they accept that. And those which cannot withstand that, they reject it. Even it is said by Buddha in some sutras. So that is, that is the, that is the, if you bring this logic, if you bring this logic, you know, Sometimes I feel some contradiction with the lumbering guru devotions. Personally, you know, we are analyzing Buddha's own teachings, whether it can be taken literally and face value or not. If that is that we are doing to Buddha, who is common to every Buddhist practitioner, undisputed. When it comes to our teachers, gurus, it is disputed. Not everyone, not every Buddha, not every Buddhist accept them as a Buddha. Maybe some of us students might accept. And so even if we are analyzing Buddha's own world, why can't we analyze our gurus? teachings, advice, instructions. 
you know. Um, um, and so because whether it's Nagarjuna, they investigate Buddha's teachings and see whether they can take literally a not face value or not. That doesn't mean they lose the respect on Buddha. They develop even more respect. That doesn't mean they have no devotions. That doesn't mean they are being, uh, uh, you know, disrespectful. And that is something I think sometimes we have this misunderstanding. If you caution your teachers, there is some kind of belief you are being disrespectful. You are not being, you are not having a, uh, you know, um, correct devotions. Uh, you know, um, to me, you know, I, to me, I think um, that shouldn't contradict, you know, and just as uh, Narajunas and all the, the, the great Indian masters done, has done to Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings. And so, and so if Buddha is not confused, and if he was not taking some kind of, you know, hallucination substance, <laughs> or, or un mentally unstable, there must be a reason why he is saying, in one sutra he said there is an inherent existence, in another sutra he is saying there is no inherent existence, in another sutra then he may distinguish some of them are inherent existence, some of them non inherent existence. What's going on here? You know? And so therefore that is the way analysis to the Buddhas. And so saying, among all these teachings, if we analyze which one can withstand the reasoning and logic and direct experience. Because not all of theory can do that. They all are kind of different. And so then through that is how we do, um, that is how Nagarjuna did, and that, that is where the definitive meaning sutra and interpretive meaning sutra comes to in play because it's important to that kind of analysis. It's just not to make complication to us, you know, definitive, interpretive and all important. There is a really uh, profound reasons um, um, to learn and to understand. Um, and so if that's the case, then why did Buddha said all of that? And then, so then, you know, um, what is the reason behind Buddha saying that? What is the purpose of saying that? And what is the true meaning of that? What is the true real intention of that? And so that is how we analyze the sutras, you know? And so then when you do that, then you, are, you when you analyze, investigate, then we see certain teachings in certain sutras, uh, you know, given to a certain individuals for in certain circumstances, in certain situation, to the need of that individual in that right time, in the right moment. So it is a skillful means. A skillful means to lead towards the ultimate goal, but because they are not mentally ripened and they are not ready to hear the highest level of the uh, selflessness. So then Buddha give them teaching on um, more growth level of selflessness as though it is the ultimate reality. And for those who are even not ready to hear that teaching or the predisposition not ready or the men, uh, the, they, they have no karma, then even then he even give even more growth level of um, the selflessness as although as almost being like that is the um, uh, the, the the ultimate um, reality, and for those who are not ready to hear selflessness, he explained as though there is a self in one sutra. He, he, there is um, well, one sutra very very short. Word, there is one where almost as he explained there is a as a self. Uh, 
the five aggregate are no Kurubon also. The five aggregate are the uh, the um, I don't know Kuru, like the burden. I think burden is not the not the right word. Uh, when you carry something, what do you call? Um, like you are carrying a baggage I guess maybe um, not not a baggage but it could be a general in the baggage seems to be more specific general uh, so like the aggregate is that and the who is carrying that is the person or the self so in that sutra he explained as though there is a self and because it was given because one disciples who have been hearing about the permanent self, Atma, that is the concept that before Buddhism came, very strong in India. And so he has been introducing that concept and from Beria and he is very ingrained with that. So strongly, if Buddha explained him selflessness, he will fall in the nihilism. He, he was not in a position to hear because he's so strongly grained and so, but Buddha knew if he kind of explained in this uh, skillful mean as there is a self and then on the basis of that, then, then teaching him to refrain from 10 non virtue action, engage in 10 virtues action, practicing the karma, through that how you, he can become a better person, more compassionate person, that, you know. And then once over the time when he's more ready, then he, he give the more teaching on selflessness slowly. So, but if he were giving a teaching on selflessness, he would be nihilism and then he wouldn't be open to the teaching on uh, other teachings, loving kindness, compassion, and uh, uh, tendon virtues, uh, reframe tendon virtues, the moral, ethical, and all of that. Then he will not get any benefit. But he see there is potentials. And so then guiding through that and then slowly, slowly, you lead that way. You know, so it is a skillful means. So, so, you know, even the literally Buddha said there is self, but it doesn't mean there is a independent or inherently existing self. That was the, not the meaning of the, the author, the, the Buddha himself. That is not the ultimate meaning. And then there is a reason and the purpose to say, give that teachings. And same with all other teachings, you know, um, we're giving according to the the needs of individual mental predispositions, um, karma, ripening and that. And it's a skillful means to lead from gradually, from more, um, from gross understanding of selfless to more subtle understanding of selfless, the more subtle understanding of selfless. And that is very skillful means to guide and lead that. But n not all of them was the Buddha's ultimate intentions, you know. And so, uh, because each of them, if you reason and logic, they cannot withstand fully, you know. Um, and so, so therefore, I think um, we have to understand that why studying is important, why Nagarjuna is, and all these. Uh, Nalenda masters, why they wrote so much and why they have all this kind of, you know, um, argument, you know. Because if we don't do that kind of analysis recently, then we can, we can get very confused because if you read different suttas, you, you can see, if, and if you take all of them literally in the first value, you, you will see so much contradictions. You know, there's another teachings, one example or like that, you know, um, one of the princes, not princess, prince, um, Mageda, um, I think his name was Ajanda Shatru in, I think, um, in, uh, in, uh, in a Sanskrit. Um, he killed his father under the influence of some in order to take the, the in order to 
become the king himself, you know, and and later he he kind of regret what he did. Not only regret, he feel very guilt of what he did, and because of that guilt, his mind become so low, depressed, and that he couldn't function as a king to take care of his citizen, you know. And so the Buddha saw him the potential. Buddha, Buddha saw him so much potential. And so then Buddha said, you know, and his father was really uh, the sponsor and good friend of Buddha. He was one of the first king who, uh, who embraced, the, who followed the Buddha and embraced him. And, then, and um, so then Buddha told him, you know, literally, um, father and mother is to be killed, you know, and there are some other words, verses, and for that, um, that um, Ajanda Satra, for him to hear Buddha saying, it's okay for to kill father and mother, is not a big deal, and that because and he, he had some respect for Buddha and he knew he has a very strong relation with his father and all of that. So he feel kind of a little bit relieved, you know, and help him to overcome feeling of so much guilt and all these negativities. And over the time, he overcome that feeling of guilt and depression and he was able to function better and that, and when he was in better state of mind, then Buddha told him, you know, when he, now he is ready to hear the teaching, more more profound teachings. At that time, if Buddha said, what you did is wrong, he was already feeling guilty and depressed. He, he was going to be devastated and he, he will not be able to come out of that state. Maybe he might take his life. But Buddha saw incredible potential in him. And so just by saying that, then he, he somehow um, feel good about it and able to come out of that state over the time. And then when he was in a good state and mind, then Buddha told him that was wrong. He had to purify and give many teachings and then he achieved a high level of realizations where um, entering the, um, um, the continuum mind stream, that level, you know, uh, area, state. And so, um, but what Buddha's, so that is the reason and purpose for saying that, literally saying that. But the ultimate meaning in Buddha's mind, when he said father and mother, he's referring to delusion and karma. Delusion and karma is to overcome, to kill, or to destroy, to overcome. That was the meaning behind that. He was not referring to the actual father and mother. So that, that, that sutra, that teaching is interpretive teaching. So there is a reason, purpose, and the meaning behind it. If you take it literally, face value, it goes against many reason and logic. In some Buddha's own teachings, and then the, it goes about many reason and logic. And so therefore you cannot take, take that as, as a definitive uh, meaning sutra. Therefore you cannot take it at face value and little. And so there, there are many teachings like that. And so that is why we have to understand which are interpretive and which are, um, um, and so that is where Nagarjuna's uh, is uh, saying, um, and Lama Tlongkhapa is saying, uh, we have to follow, um, the teachings of such as Nagarjuna's, and even even with the Nagarjuna and the sutras, even within that there can be interpretive and definitive meaning sutra. Within that we have to follow the definitive meaning sutras and uh, teachings, and so we have to uh, rely on that. Uh, so I think that is the next. That is what uh, so. So therefore, um, at the end of that, then that it says, um, 
Therefore, you should rely on commentary without errors. So therefore, we should rely on commentaries, those unmistaken commentaries, um, to understand the, those different sutras um, by relying on those unmistaken commentaries by such as Nagarjuna and so forth. And even those, not just because Nagarjuna said, not because Chandrakiti said, but again, because if you use reasoning and logic and investigate and analyze it, they can withstand those investigation analysis and because of that. And if you try to, again, um, on top of that, then if you try to apply your own data experience, your data experience will also confirm that, you know. Um, so, so I think with today, I think maybe, I think maybe we'll just leave it here. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't planning to go as much detail as I went, um, but I guess that's what happens sometimes. You can plan something and sometimes, you know, certain things you want to go more detail, certain thing maybe you think maybe you will not go detail then, but when once you start teaching some, sometimes your mind take away somewhere else, you know, because maybe I took some substance. Okay. Due to the merit of this virtuous action, may I clearly attain the state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme bodhicitta, jewel bodhicitta, that has not arise and arise and grow. And may that which arise and not diminish, but increase more and more. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta, that has not arise and arise and grow. And may that which is arising, uh, oh, the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit, happiness, this world, to the incomparable kind in the Yasuo, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. To to chan xin chan kuen jya ve te zin chan pe ve kuen so to pa ra zi Chyo sun ku ve le mo tu chu a ta so tu je kuen du sha ten So thank you very much, thank you very much everyone, good night. <laughs>